Cambridge-based company uh, working with self-driving cars. Um, one moment. Yeah, just set up. Uh, you can use that one as well. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. So uh, my name is Sebastian, and I'm from Five AI. Um, Yeah, I'm one of the early employees, and today this talk I'm gonna do together with Tom, a colleague of mine, a software engineer working for the data team, and he will take the second part actually where we basically explain the, the actual the method. So I will basically form now the introduction and also the experiments later. Okay, so first about our company, what is actually Five AI? So. Uh, Five AI is a venture capital funded startup that's working in actually six locations. We are here in Cambridge, but we are also in Oxford, London, Bristol, Edinburgh, and Melbourne. And what we're doing is we are using the power of autonomy to transform Europe cities for everyone. Um, what does this actually mean? So we're creating a self-driving car. Here I can show you our latest prototype. And we're going to bring this to the customer as a service, basically as a taxi service, but without drivers. We have raised 36 million so far, <coughs> and we are growing constantly. So we're having a European team, and we're actually starting with our data collection in London <coughs> this summer. And we will also start testing on public roads this year. So this are actually us. You see a bit of an older picture from, uh, some, uh, from Christmas last year. And we're basically bringing together some of the best people from the business side and also academic side, uh, academia. For example, our uh, founder and CEO, Stan Bowler, has right has sold companies for more than one billion aggregate so far. And we are also having some of the um, best professors uh, in computer vision and machine learning. Ah, sorry, it's not working. <laughs> okay. uh, like uh, Andrew Blake and Phil Thor from Oxford. And today, we actually already more than 100 people. And around 45 of those uh, have PhDs. But now, going actually further to the problem, because you can, uh, building a self-driving car, of course, has like many aspects. So there's, for example, uh, there's like all, all kinds of sensors you need to sense the environment around you. Then there's like the perception side that actually uh, interprets w what the car can see, or not necessarily see, because it might be different sensors. Then planning around those, and finally executing controls to all like the steering and brakes and acceleration and so on. But this talk is actually about the perception side. And as you might already know, like one of the latest uh, perception models is actually the neural network. There have been some breakthroughs in the recent years, and it's also while we think it's one of the components that should be used, because in some cases, it, the performance actually has exceeded or at least um, has been as good as humans. And this, that's one of the things that I've been showing here. For example, there's the Google Linnet that in the uh, ImageNet Challenge 2014 uh, has reached a human performance. Basically. But one of the issues with these uh, neural networks is that they need a lot of data. And if a lot of data in this case, it was 1.2 million images. But in a specific case, here, this was only classification. It means looking at an image and saying what's in this image. But actually, for self-driving cars, we, I mean, if you look at the road, you probably know that there's already a road. You actually want to know way more details. You want to know exactly where's the road, where, are, for example, other cars, where are pedestrian, and so on. So, and actually, to to basically be able to classify and to, to automatically perceive all these things, there might be much more data needed than that. And this 
training data is usually obtained manually. That means there are actually people looking at the images saying what's in there. And this is obviously costly, especially if you need to do this for millions of images. And now I'm gonna show you a bit more specific what I mean with this data. So these are two example databases. They're actually, uh, the left one is more academic. Actually, the right one is also an academic database, but in a consortium together uh, with some companies. Uh, by you, Apollo, for example, is involved. And here we already basically, this is like images. And on top are the labels of the images, which are like represented as colors. And the point is that we now basically want to recognize where are the different parts and different objects in this image. For example, then on the left, you can see there's like, one thing is obviously the road, there's like sidewalk, then there are cars in blue, there are pedestrians in red, and so on and so forth, like a lot of classes. <coughs> there have been actually people painting over the images what each pixel means. And this is obviously a laborious task and it takes about 90 minutes per inch. On the right, this is a newer database from, yeah, from the University of Berkeley. It's been actually released only a few weeks ago. And there they focus a bit more task specific. So also the task that I wanna to talk today is where are lanes on the road? Like, I mean, if you're a county, obviously usually you want to follow a lane, but sometimes you need to change the uh, lane to overtake someone so on and so forth. Here it's, a quite important task for autonomous cars to find out about. And they say, okay, we only label actually about this specific task, and then we save a lot of time. And in this image, for example, they can already get down the annotation time to 1.1 minute. So we're gonna do something similar. So we have our own data set from 5AI, so where we also, for example, label where's the road, where's non-road where are different lanes, where's the lane that we are currently on, we call it ego lane, and yeah, in this case there are only two lanes, so it's lane one and one two. And using our system, we actually get the labeling down to five seconds, and that's basically what the rest uh, that Tom is gonna take over soon is gonna be about, is to explain how we actually can make this happen to actually get all the labels for an image like this in only five seconds. And that's actually one of the points that uh, I want to stress. Although now all this success uh, uh, ha has been achieved by using convolutional neural networks, we can actually get the labels in a semi-automated fashion using more traditional geometric methods of computer vision. And this is now, I'm gonna hand over to Tom, who's gonna show how we're actually doing this. Hi, I'm Tom. I work as a software developer on this system. So, how can we find the lanes in an image? So obviously one way is we can have a person shade in the lanes on the road, but that's very laborious. Now, there is another way that people can identify the lanes on a road. When you get behind the wheel of a car and you drive it, you normally succeed in identifying the lanes on the road. You, you normally manage. Nine out of 10 journeys don't end in the hospital. So most drivers succeed in following the lane. So if you turn that round, what we can say is, wherever the car went, there was probably a lane there. So we have a potential to identify the lane automatically just from the act of driving. And that's the plan. So imagine you've driven down here, you were following a lane, it was a left lane of a two lane each way road, um, and we have a series of images from each point in the path. Okay, so what do we wanna do? First of all, collect videos with a dash cam, fairly straightforward, mass market product, no problem. Second, we take the video and we analyze it to work out the, three the positions and orientations in three-dimensional space of the video camera throughout that video. So we can work out the relative position that the camera had at each frame of the video. So typically, the relative position is gonna be like a straight line going forwards, but obviously if the road bends, then it'll bend. If you go over a railway bridge, it'll go up and down, and so on. We can capture all of that. Next, from the camera positions, we wanna work out where the car was and the orientation of the car, which way is down and so on, which we can do. And having done all of that, 
we can assume that there's a lane of you know, two and a half meters, roughly the car went down the middle of the lane. So if we can do all of that, we've got a guess at to where a lane probably was, pretty good guess, fully automatically. But it's not quite right. So to solve the last bit, then we do, we bring this 3D model and the video image into a web interface and we ask the annotator to just correct it and push the lane edges so they line up with the, with the curbs and the white lines. Uh, and they can also add in uh, bands of non-road, the oncoming lanes, the other lanes, which are generally just parallel to the lane you drove down. So that's again is a relatively straightforward task. <coughs> okay, first step, video collection. So we don't need to take our autonomous vehicle prototype out with all of its cameras and all of that. We can just get a dash cam off Amazon, no special, nothing spe no special equipment required, stick it to the windscreen, don't need to line it up just as long as it's vaguely capturing the front. Um, 1080p, 30 frames a second, and dash cam has a cheap GPS chip so it can get a rough GPS location for every frame that we record. So that's, that's a good start. Now we have a video of car driving. Okay, next step. This is where it gets interesting. By looking, I, I don't, we can identify bits of subsequent images that are very similar. So you know, in this case, you could find a detail um, around the number on the bus, on the back of the bus. And we, that's the same in every image. So that we can find the feature that matches across different images. Now we found the feature, the differences in the position and the rotation and the scale of that feature in the different images tell you something about how the camera's moved. And if you do this across all of the features in the image, you can derive a best guess as to the camera's motion. And if it all works, it'll almost certainly be very nearly correct. So it's a very good estimate. So this gives you the 3D positions of every frame in the, in the video sequence. Okay, so we have the positions. That's good. But I mean, if you have a sequence of positions going around, a cur a cur uh, going around in a curve, you don't know. It might be that the road's flat under those positions, or it could be there's like a 45-degree banking or something. If you're at the test track, there is a 45-degree banking, but on the public roads, it's not very likely. So we need some way to work out which way is down and what the road surface is. Now we can do that if you look at the successive positions. Where the, where the road goes around a bend, the, the, um, the positions, the vectors between one position and the next change. The cross product of those vectors, so the perpendicular, gives you a down direction. And that allows you to determine the road surface plane at that point in the journey. Obviously it can change going over hills and so on. So that gives you the road surface. As I said, we don't have to line the camera up exactly. Um, we can work out from the positions, we can work out um, how the uh, which way was forward, which way the car was facing. So we can work all of that out. <coughs> and finally, we've got a path on the ground that the car followed, and then we just make a, this is just like a rough assumption, we just start with a hard-coded fixed lane width. So say it's like three meters wide, a meter and a half either side of the, the camera. Um, we can tune that. And this uh, gives you an example to give you an idea of the kind of thing. This is a pretty typical example, I'd say. So if you look at the blue path, this is the automatically generated lane that we're projecting. So it, it's not bad. It is a viable, drivable path. You, know, you can drive that. That's, that's all drivable. It's, it's not perfect. You can see at the end there, the road's getting a bit wider. Maybe it's approaching a junction. And um, we haven't captured that because the automated lane is just a fixed, hard-coded width assumption. But we take this and we bring it into our interface. So it's nearly right. We have some control points and the annotator can nudge these points out until it lines up with the lane. Now, you might think that sounds just the same as what we're talking about originally, humans annotating each frame. The key difference is, if you remember back, we take a video sequence of maybe 200 meters. So you've got 200 meter video sequence. Now this is a 3D model and it's valid for all 200 frames of the video sequence. So the key thing is when they get this, it, normally when you get one image right, you know, after a minute or whatever, you go on to the next frame and you have to do it all over again. But in this case, because it's a 3D model, when it's right, it's right for all the frames. So you get 100 frames in one go. And that's how it comes out to five seconds an image or less. It's not, that every, it's not that people are doing an image every five seconds, it's they're doing 100 images in a minute. 
as a batch. So we've got the, um, we can adjust the path and then we can put in an oncoming traffic lane. Uh, we just put that parallel to the path of the car and again you can adjust it manually. Generally lanes are fairly parallel so that again works pretty well. Because we've captured our ego motion, the car that had the camera in motion, we know the line of the road. Uh, this just uh, gives you a quick idea. So the left is the before, the right is the after. This is in our web interface that we, the annotators use. Uh, so this is the software I work on. Uh, so the left you see before, we have a swept path for the ego lane. It's captured the line that we drove down. It's not exactly got the width of the lanes. On the right, the annotators widen the lane so it matches the lane, uh, the actual the lane in reality. They've added parallel lanes. In this case, it's a dual carriageway with four lanes going in the same direction. And they've also added some yellow on the left. So this is very important. You can just have another parallel swathe of an arbitrary width and say all of this is not road. And that allows us to capture the boundary between the road and the not road, which is obviously quite important for an autonomous car to be able to recognize. Uh, and the final thing is um, the stuff above the horizon is generally not road, so we can just have a horizon the annotator just drags down with the mouse and then that <coughs> categorizes all of that of not road. And if I'm very lucky, I will quit. So this is, okay. Uh, so this is another way of looking at it, looking at the hierarchy of annotation. So top left is the video that we collect uh, with our dash cam, the raw video. Uh, it's categorized into road and not road. And within that, it's categorized as the ego lane, the lane you drove down, the other lane, the rest of the road and not road. And then the rest of the road itself breaks down. So you see here, if you look closely, on the left, there's a cycle lane just starting. So we've annotated that. You know, 0.8 meters or whatever. On the right, there's the oncoming traffic, another cycle lane beyond that, the pavement, and so on. So this just kind of gives you an idea how once you build a 3D model, it projects into all the frames. The real sequences are a bit longer than that, but gives you an idea. Okay, so what kind of, um, what kind of results are we getting? Um, so we're talking about annotation time. Uh, so yeah, as I was saying, the point is, you have a sequence of images, and you might spend six, six minutes on average, if it's in town, it's complicated, you've got junctions and so on, annotating um, that. But you know, if you've got one or two hundred images, it, it works out as maybe you know, five seconds per image. And once you get out of town on a country road or a motorway, where there's few junctions and the road structure is relatively consistent, you know, it, it could be one or two seconds per image. So it's a really efficient way to use human time to create training data sets for machine learning. Um, yeah, just, the, we're releasing a data set. Um, it's mostly urban because that's our focus at 5AI on safe urban driving. We have got some highway, um, motorways, and some country, country roads. Get some diversity in there, able to cope with different types of scenarios. Um, and you might be wondering, well, the, the annotation may be very quick, but is it any good? Um, so we, uh, we got um, two of our annotators to annotate the same uh, images, and uh, they were 97.2% in agreement, so to speak. So uh, they're at least consistent with each other, and we're fairly confident that means they're consistent with reality also. And there's Sebastian. Okay, thanks, Tom. So the next part I want to talk about is now we have basically created a database of images and we know which part is for example a road and not road or which where the different lanes in these images but what we're actually going to do with this is because as we go along on the car we won't actually predict exactly these things and this is now basically the experiments that we're doing uh, of basically the system running how we would do the predictions on the car and what we use is like uh, basically a convolutional neural network for semantic segmentation. It's the model we use is the deep lab model. It has been actually created by Google Research. And, but we, the important part is that we train it on our databases and we compare it with other databases, and namely the cityscapes, the one you saw before at the beginning, and also Mapillary and Kitty. These are other public databases that are also available with similar data. And, okay, maybe a few words of the deep net model because probably you don't know, uh, or most people, who knows what semantic segmentation when I talk about this. 
Okay, everybody. Um, so the idea is that you get an image in, as we saw before, and we want to basically predict where are different uh, pixels within the image. For example, here for the deep lab model, we have an image of a cat, and I don't know if you can see it, it's a bit small, but basically whereas the cat in the image, you see that there's a specific color, that, and this color basically means probably animal or cat, and that this is then classified like this. Therefore, this is basically the architecture of the neural network. Okay, you don't, it's not important about the details, but it's basically trained on the images. And this is the result we would get if we train it on our data set and compare it and for testing for evaluation of data on different other data sets, the ones I named before. We do basically this cross data set experiments and on average we actually get an the section of a union, that's, it's a metric to measure how well we can actually predict pixels. And we get uh, relatively high of 84, and other data sets are a bit lower, but it's about in the same range, but the, the main point is that we are much faster in getting all these annotations. You see in, uh, in the bottom is actually our model predicting where's the road and non-road. So close by to the car, it does a very, accurate job, but the further it goes ahead, the more difficult it is actually to see the road boundaries and uh, it's basically a bit fuzzy. And then for the two other tasks that we also have annotations, was uh, now show the same for the eagle lane prediction. There are other data sets uh, do not actually have these annotations, only the kitty one, that's why we can compare with them. And finally the lane instances. So there you see basically that we not only categorize where is actually road or non-road, but that each of them is basically a separate instance of a lane, and in this case, they are free. Mm -hmm. Just the same thing, oh. The same thing as a video here. And it looks basically relatively similar than the annotations, but this time, these are all predictions from the model. And you see, for example, that there is a flickering in the lower right. I'll play it again, because the model basically only predicts lane instances per single frame. And it doesn't have the way to associate actually consecutive frames. So it just says, okay, the lane on the right is uh, uh, the lane on the right is green, and the one on the left is blue. But it only means that they're actually different lanes. So if the color flickers, it's just that they haven't been associated; that it's actually the same lane from the previous frame which is uh, but relatively easy to do. Okay. And this is another video where we actually predict the ego lane here in uh, the brighter blue and the other parts of the road in uh, darker blue. You can see, so once we are on a road and following a lane, it does a, quite a stable job, but when we get close to a crossing, you see in a moment when we turn, because there the, the ego lane, the lane that you're currently on, is not well defined right? actually across the crossing. But then when you're again following a specific lane, it becomes basically stable again. So this, all these predictions we're doing here is per single image. That's also why it's always a bit flickery. Like when we would do the same thing actually in the car, we would take the whole sequence so that we remember the past and basically integrate this in time and then the flickering basically goes away and becomes more stable. And yeah, that's it. And obviously this is a kind of, it's a difficult job to do this and you need the right people. But we're growing fast, and in the, uh, over the last year, for example, our headcount has tripled. And yeah, if you would like to join, just yeah, shout out. We're always looking for bright people. And thank you very much. <laughs>